Welcome to the Trinity's Podcast, where we explore theories about the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Do you love God enough to think about Him? Episode 202, Gregory of Nazianzus versus Noah Worcester on Subordinationist Texts. Famously, there are a number of passages in the Gospels where Jesus seems to imply that he's a limited and dependent being. And so you would think he can't be God, or if you like, he can't be fully divine. In this episode of the Trinity's podcast, you're going to hear how two different leading Christian intellectuals deal with such passages. Each one has a methodology, a general approach, and it's up to you to decide which one you think makes more sense overall, given all the relevant facts. The first person we'll hear from is the famous Bishop Gregory of Nazianzus, who was born in about 330 AD and died in 390 He's one of the three famous Cappadocian fathers who is famous for pioneering the distinction between hypostasis and usia, so more or less credited with coming up with a standard Trinitarian language. He actually presided over a part of the Second Ecumenical Council held in the year 381. The first guy who presided died during the meeting, and then to his surprise, Gregory was appointed. He was also appointed by the emperor as bishop over Constantinople because he was on the Nicene side. Anyway, Gregory tried to lead the meeting for a while and then eventually quit in disgust because he didn't like the political maneuvering that was going on. A little bit before that council, sometime between 379 and 381, Gregory of Nazianzus gave five famous theological orations. These are polemical theological sermons that he gave at the small Nicene church that he was assigned to preside over before he was appointed as bishop over Constantinople. We'll hear a little bit of his third oration and then of his fourth, and in both places he's dealing with these what I'll call subordinationist texts about Jesus. Gregory is very beloved in Catholic tradition and in Eastern Orthodox tradition. He was trained as a professional orator. As far as eloquence goes, as far as verbal maneuvering, he knows how to slice and dice. He knows how to be aggressive without just being vulgar and insulting, like, say, Athanasius. He knows how to put things in a favorable way. He knows how to cast himself as the hero and the other guys as the bad guys and do it artfully. There's also an economy to his expression. He doesn't carry on at massive length like someone like Augustine will do, but he delivers measured blows. But what you should ask is, what shall we think of the way he reads these scriptures? This will be from a recent translation published in 2007 by St. Vladimir's Seminary Press, based in Crestwood, New York. This translation is done by Lionel Wickham in a book called On God and Christ, the Five Theological Orations, and two letters to Cladonius by St. Gregory of Nazianzus. In the third theological oration, numbered as Oration 29 in his overall canon, you could say, in section 17, he's just argued that surely the Son has a divine nature because look at all the high titles and amazing things that he has called. Things like God and Word and the One who is in the beginning, truth and life. And then having recounted all of these lofty titles, which he thinks makes it obvious that Christ must have a divine nature, he then turns to what I've called the subordinationist texts, which he knows his non-Nicene opponents will demand an account of. Here's what he says. Count up the phrases that in your ignorance you set over against these, my God and your God, greater, he created, he made, and He sanctified. Reckon in, if you like, slave and obedient. He gave. He learned. He was commanded. He was sent. He could do nothing, speak nothing, judge nothing, give nothing, will nothing of himself. You may add these. His ignorance, his subjection, his praying his 
asking his progress and growing up. Put in, if you like, all the even lowlier expressions used about him. The fact that he slept, was hungry, got tired, wept, was in agony, was subjected. Maybe you reproach him for his cross and death. I expect you will let his resurrection and ascension go free, seeing that here there is something on our side. You can pick up many more scraps besides these. If you mean to go on fabricating this intruder of yours, this namesake of God, for us, he is true God and on the same level as the Father. Yes, one could easily go through each of these expressions in detail and give you the truly religious interpretation. It is not a hard task to clear away the stumbling block that the literal text of Scripture contains. That is, if your stumbling is real and not just willful malice. In sum, you must predicate the more sublime expressions of the divine nature, of the nature which transcends bodily experiences, and the lowlier expressions of the compound, of him who because of you was emptied, became incarnate, and, to use equally valid language, was made man. Then next he was exalted, in order that you might have done with the earthbound carnality of your opinions, and might learn to be nobler, to ascend with the divine nature, and not linger on in things visible, but rise up to spiritual realities, that you might know what belongs to his nature, and what to God's plan of salvation. Now when I said divine nature in the passage, this translator put the word Godhead I don't like the word Godhead. I think it's archaic and doesn't communicate the meaning. What he's saying about all of those subordinationist texts is that they have to do with the human nature. He puts it in terms of our compound nature, which is opposed, he thinks, to the simple nature, which is divine. The compound nature is what we have, body and soul. So what he's saying is that it's the human nature there, which says, my God and your God, which says God is greater which had to learn, which had to be commanded, which could do nothing of himself, which was ignorant, right? Didn't know the day or the hour of the second coming, was subject, was praying to God. All of that really has to do, he thinks, with the human nature. And if you read the passage as the spiritual do, as the truly intellectual do, then you will see that the divine nature doesn't have any of those limitations. In his fourth theological oration, which is called Oration 30 in his overall works, he returns to a bunch of these subordinationist texts, and I'm not going to present all of them because I want you to be able to hear more of Worcester. He's going through these subordinationist texts as urged by the non-Nicenes, the so-called Arians or Neo-Arians. He says this, Their tenth point is his ignorance, The fact that no one except the Father knows the last day or hour, not even the Son himself. And of course, he's quoting there Mark 13, 32. Gregory continues, Yet how can any fact be unknown to wisdom, the world's maker, who perfects, transforms, and limits things created, and knows the things of God, just as man's spirit knows the things in man? What knowledge could be more perfect than that? How can he know distinctly what precedes the hour of the world's end, what, so to say, lies on its surface, and yet not know the hour itself? The thing is like a riddle, like saying a person has a distinct knowledge of what is in front of a wall, but does not know the wall itself, or that he distinctly knows the end of the day, but does not know the beginning of night. Knowledge of one thing here necessarily involves knowledge of the other. Surely everyone will see that if you separate the real from the apparent meaning of the passage, it is saying that he does know as God, but that as man, he does not. The absolute use of the title son here, without any relational qualification of the term telling you whose son, provides us with a deeper meaning so that we interpret this ignorance in the most truly religious way by ascribing it not to the divine but to the human. What he's suggesting is that by Jesus referring to himself as the Son, 
of course, the meaning is the son of God. And of course, a son of God, a true son, would have to be fully divine. And so obviously we know absolutely everything. So then when he says he doesn't know the day or hour of his future return, it's very paradoxical, right? Because how could a fully divine being not know the time of his coming return? Isn't that something that's knowable? Couldn't you, as it were, just see that if you had a God's eye point of view? So there is something ignorant here of the day and hour. And that thing, he says at the end of the passage, is Christ's human nature. Now about this strategy overall, I just want to make three comments. One comment is clearly he's already committed to the two natures theory. And so we'd have to put this in a broader context. We'd have to look at what are his arguments for there being both a divine and a human nature in Christ. Here he's just answering objections that are really rather obvious and seemingly sensible objections, but he's just answering objections we're not going to take time right now to go through all of his reasons why he thinks there has to be a fully divine nature in Christ. Another point is this. If the human nature of Jesus is ignorant, that is, has limited knowledge, then it must be the sort of thing that can have knowledge. It looks like the nature here then is a human person. Remember that nature can mean being, entity. In this sense of the word, you're a human nature and I'm a human nature. If he's saying there is a human nature here, which knows some things, but has strong limits on its knowledge, mm, that sounds like a man. So then it looks like we have the eternal divine logos and also a man. And that looks like one too many Jesuses. Now, maybe he has an answer to that, and maybe he doesn't. But one other observation. Just keep in mind how theoretical all of this is. Of course, nothing anywhere in the New Testament says that Christ has two natures and that one's ignorant and that one knows all and that one nature is all powerful and the other nature is limited in power. This is an explanation which is brought to the text allegedly to sort out this apparent contradiction that Jesus must be fully divine and yet he has these limits which a fully divine being couldn't have. And the strategy is to say, well, those limits just belong to the human nature. All right, but this isn't something the authors tell us. And so we have to keep in mind the possibility that we've gone wrong, that we're projecting something onto the text that actually isn't there. When the Trinity's podcast returns, a different perspective on the subordinationist texts about Jesus. <laughs> Worcester is a fascinating character from early America. I talked a little bit about his life in podcast 196 when I presented some of his writings on the idea of atonement in the New Testament. He was at various times a pastor, state representative, and a journal editor, and he was famous for several books, including a defense of pacifism. And his general theological stance is he's what I would call a subordinationist Unitarian. So he believes that the one God just is the Father. He believes that the Son is a different and lesser being, although he does believe in the pre-existence of the Son, just because he thinks it's right there in the New Testament, such as in John 1 and in the writings of Paul. So in my view, he is a kind of Unitarian. He's not exactly the same kind of Unitarian as most today who call themselves Biblical Unitarians. But the reason I find him so interesting is just his very sure-footed, careful, common-sense reasoning. He's a man of maturity and experience, and he applies the sort of careful reasoning he would in everyday life to understanding the Bible. So now I'm going to present to you a tract that he published in 1827. It was printed in Boston for the American Unitarian Association, and it's called the Doctrine of Pronouns Applied to Christ's Testimony of Himself by Noah Worcester. He starts off with a preface, 
but it gets more interesting after that. So without further ado, here's the entire tract. Preface. Situated and employed, as the writer of the following pages has been for a number of years, it may be thought that he now deviates from the path of prudence in suffering this tract to appear with his name. He therefore deems it proper to say that he has long been grieved to see his fellow Christians alienated from each other, that he has believed these alienations to arise in a great degree from contentions about the natural dignity of the Messiah. While far too little respect has been paid to the spirit he displayed in his example and enjoined by his precepts, that when the argument stated in this tract occurred to his mind, it impressed him with a belief that it was adapted to command the attention of all serious Christians, as they must feel interested to have the moral character of their common Lord stand unimpeached by any hypothesis for explaining his testimony. He has reflected much on the subject since the argument was reduced to writing and has not been able to discover any rational or scriptural ground on which it is liable to objection. He is therefore led to hope that by giving it to the public, he may do something which will produce more caution, more candor, more forbearance and brotherly love among brethren of different sects, and that in consequence of this change of feeling, they will be better prepared to unite their exertions to abolish all anti-Christian customs. That the writer should indulge such a hope may appear to many as the fruit of arrogance or delusion, yet were it not for this hope, he would sooner commit the manuscript to the flames than send it to the printer. From a review of the history of Christians from the days of Constantine to this century, it would appear that the greater part of the clergy have thought it a very light thing for men to live in hatred and strife, or even to be employed in shedding each other's blood compared with being in error respecting the natural dignity of the Son of God. How numerous have been the volumes published on this subject, and how innumerable the sermons which have been delivered, while well, there has been an almost total silence as to any proper testimony against a custom which involves every species of crime and has destroyed more than a thousand millions of our race. Instead of bearing proper testimony against this custom, a very great portion of the clergy have, for fourteen centuries, been directly or indirectly promoters of robbery and bloodshed. If the clergy of Christendom would now lay aside their party and sectarian animosities and unite their exertions to cultivate and diffuse the gospel principles of love, forbearance, and peace, how glorious must be the effects! Soon the several countries might be filled with the blessed fruits of that wisdom which is from above. The writer was once himself a Trinitarian, and he has not forgotten that he then conscientiously adopted the very mode of interpreting our Savior's testimony to which he now objects. He therefore freely acquits others of insincerity or wrong motive in adopting the principle which he now believes to be incorrect and dangerous. He has ever felt a respect for the denomination of Christians from which he found it his duty to dissent, and he wishes ever to retain towards them the feelings of a brother. If this tract may be the means of abating the unkind and unconciliatory spirit, which has long been too manifest among Christians, he will not have labored in vain. But if it should cause an increase of that spirit, it will be to him an occasion of deep regret. The Doctrine of Pronouns Applied to Christ's Testimony of Himself Number 1. The Doctrine of Pronouns Stated Pronouns are words used as substitutes for the names of persons or things to avoid a too frequent repetition of the same word or sound. A personal pronoun is a substitute for the name or title of a person, and it implies all that the name or title would imply if used in the same place. Example Abraham was a good man. He was the friend of God, and God loved him and made a covenant with him. In this sentence, he is used once and him twice as a substitute for the name Abraham. The meaning would be the same in the following form. Abraham was a good man. Abraham was the friend of God, and God loved Abraham and made a covenant with Abraham. He and him, therefore, are pronouns. The word person is applied to any intelligent being, to God, to Christ, to any angel or any man 
whether in the body or out of the body. A human person in the present state is supposed to possess two distinct natures, a body and a soul, the one matter, the other mind or spirit, the one mortal, the other immortal. These two natures with all the members, senses, properties, and powers of the body, and all the energies or faculties of the mind or soul, are so united and identified as to be but one person. Yet notwithstanding this union and identity, some things may be affirmed of one member or part of the person, which cannot be affirmed of another, nor of the man considered as a person. A man may say, My hands can neither see nor hear nor taste nor smell, and my hair cannot feel. Yet he may not say of himself as a person, I can neither see nor hear nor taste nor smell nor feel. So a man may say, My body cannot think nor will, nor has it any consciousness of right or wrong. That he cannot say this of his mind or soul, nor of himself as a person. It would be falsehood for him to say, I cannot think nor will, nor have I any sense of right or wrong. The pronouns I, my, myself include the whole person. Suppose then that John should say, I cannot think, I cannot choose, I have no sense of right and wrong. Peter asks him what he means by such strange declarations. John replies, I spoke only of my body, my inferior nature. I did not say that my soul could not do these things. Now, what would be thought of John's veracity or the propriety of his explanation? In the common use of language, when a man has occasion to speak of any part of his person and to affirm of that part what is not true of his whole person, he uses the neuter pronoun it. It is so even of his soul, which is the most important part of his person. There is one exception, and one only which occurs to my mind, among Christians who believe in the immortality of the soul as well as the mortality of the body, Custom has authorized the use of an apparent contradiction. A man may say, I shall die, and I shall not die. I shall live but a little while, and I shall live forever. Here the personal pronoun I is used in both cases, but such a manner of speaking would be very improper if the declarations were made to a person or an audience unacquainted with the doctrine of the soul's immortality. Number 2 The Doctrine of Pronouns Applied Let the preceding remarks be applied to the Trinitarian mode of explaining the testimony of Christ respecting His dependence on God. It is well known that the Trinitarian adopts this hypothesis that Christ is God and man in one person. Here we have two distinct minds to one body, supposed to be united and identified in the one person, Jesus Christ. The possibility of such a union I shall neither deny nor discuss. I am ignorant on that subject. But admitting the hypothesis to be correct, it is very clear that the man is as nothing to the deity in this person. The divinity must be all in all as to the sufficiency, the operations, and the glory of Christ. In this case, as in the one before stated, some things might be truly affirmed of one part of the person, which could not with propriety be said of the other. But when Christ or any other person says, I can or I cannot do this or that, the pronoun I embraces all the powers of the person. Everyone will admit that it would be improper for me to say, I cannot think, expecting to clear myself from falsehood on being questioned by saying that I spoke only of my body or my little finger. How unfortunate, then, is the method which has been adopted in explaining the language of Christ. He said, I can do nothing of myself. The Father in me, he does the works. My Father is greater than I. When such language is urged as proof that Christ was not the independent God, the Trinitarians venture to say that, in such declarations, Christ spoke only of his human nature. As man he was dependent, yet as God he was independent. Let it now be supposed that, on the trial of Christ before the Jewish Sanhedrin, had he been questioned as to his meaning in so often declaring his dependence on God, 
Suppose, too, that he had given the Trinitarian explanation, saying, I spoke then of my human nature only, yet I am God equal with the Father. Nay, I am the God of Abraham, who was worshipped by your fathers, and whom you profess to worship. Would not his judges have had ground for a more serious accusation than they had on his owning that he was the Son of God? Might they not very justly have said to him, Either the language which you have adopted in your preaching to the people was equivocal and deceptive, or what you have now said is completely false, asserting, as you did, that you could do nothing of yourself, was a full declaration that you had no claim to be regarded as God. How then can you now expect to be believed in saying that you are God equal with the Father? Besides, who before this ever heard of the Father of Abraham's God? But no such formidable accusation could his enemies bring against the faithful and true witness. Never, I believe, did the Messiah in any instance so contradict his testimony respecting his dependence as to intimate even to his apostles that he was God and man in one person, or that he was in any sense or respect the independent God. Nor does it appear that his apostles ever understood him to assert his independence or self-existence. Number three, John's care to prevent misapprehensions. John was the disciple whom Jesus loved, the last of the evangelists who wrote his history, and the one who recorded the discourses in which Christ most explicitly asserted his dependence on God for his commission and authority, his wisdom and power in all he said or did. In many instances, John evinced special care to have the words of Christ understood or to prevent any misapprehensions of his meaning. He not only explained several names and titles as Cephas, Thomas, Siloam, Rabbi, and Messiah, but he also told Christ's meaning in several instances in which he had been misapprehended by his hearers, and some which were likely to be misunderstood by the readers of his history. In the second chapter, we are told that the Jews said to Jesus, What sign will you show us, seeing that you're doing these things? To this demand, Jesus answered, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. By their reply, the Jews fully evinced that they misunderstood what he meant by the temple. Jesus did not then deem it incumbent on him to correct their mistake. But lest readers should be at a loss respecting Christ's meaning, John thus explains, But Jesus spoke of the temple of his body. 5, 18-20 In chapter 6, verse 64, Jesus said to his audience, But there are some of you who do not believe. John explains, For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were who did not believe, and who should betray him. Chapter 7, verses 38 and 39, Jesus had said, He that believes on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. On this metaphorical language, John observes, But this he spoke of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. For the Holy Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. John 11, 11, 12, and 13, Jesus said to his disciples, Our friend Lazarus is asleep, and I go, that I may awake him out of sleep. Then said his disciples, Lord, if he is sleeping, shall he not do well? John then explains, However, Jesus spoke of his death, but they thought he had spoken of taking rest and sleep. John 12, 32, Jesus said, And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to myself. John again explains, This he said, signifying what death he should die. John 13, 10, and 11, While washing his disciples' feet, Jesus said, You are clean, but not all of you. The reason for this remark is given by John, for he knew who would betray him. Therefore, he said, you are not all clean. John 21, 18, Jesus said to Peter, truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you dressed yourself and walked wherever you wanted to. But when you are old, you will stretch forth your hands and another shall dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. Here, John adds, This he spoke, signifying by what death he should glorify God. In the last mentioned chapter, John relates that P. 
Peter, seeing him, said to Jesus, And what shall this man do? Jesus said to him, If I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to you? Having related the question and the answer, John states and corrects a mistake which occurred. Then this saying went out among the brothers, that the disciple should not die. Yet Jesus did not say to him, He shall not die. But, If I will that he tarries until I come, what is that to you? Now let it be seriously considered how often Christ had, in a direct form, declared his dependence on God, or disclaimed self-sufficiency, and how certain it is that John must have known that such language was adapted to impress the belief that Christ was not the independent God. Then we may ask, why did not John give an explanation, as in less urgent cases, and say, these things Christ spoke of his human nature, and not of himself as God? Surely if John knew or believed that Christ was an independent person or being, he must also have known that such an explanation was of vastly greater importance than any now to be found in his gospel. Had he been a Trinitarian, like those of modern times, he would not have allowed such a mass of testimony importing the personal and absolute dependence of Christ to have passed without endeavoring to neutralize it by some explanation. Had John regarded Christ as God, of how little importance it would have appeared to him to explain what Christ meant by the sleep of Lazarus or the temple that he would raise up in three days, compared with telling what he meant by a hundred passages, which implied that he was a dependent being and received all his sufficiency from the Father. It is not in my heart to call into question the uprightness or sincerity of my Trinitarian brethren, but I am compelled to wonder that they do not see that their explanation of our Lord's words imputes to him such a habit of using equivocal and deceptive language as would ruin the character of any other person. Had he been an independent person, I know not what language he could have used more false and deceptive than many things which John has recorded as said by him. Yet this language was not explained by himself, nor by his careful and friendly disciple. Neither by himself nor by John is it so much as intimated that, in speaking of his personal dependence, he did not speak of his whole person, as Moses would have done in using the same language. Is it not then an extraordinary method of honoring the Messiah to assert his independence at the expense of his veracity? Yet this seems to be done with very great confidence by his Trinitarian disciples. But let any Trinitarian ask himself whether he would feel safe in frequently using such deceptive language without explanation, as his theory imputes to him in whose lips there was no guile. May I not say that a good man would shrink with horror at the thought of adopting such a practice? When the Trinity's podcast returns, Worcester presses his point. Number 4. The Trinitarian's Explanation Not Accordant with His Own Hypothesis I may now advance a step farther. If Jesus Christ was personally the independent God, His declarations of dependence on the Father cannot be true in the sense contended for by Trinitarians. For their hypothesis is not that the human nature was united to the Father, but to a second person as independent as the Father. Now, who cannot see that personal self-sufficiency precludes the possibility of personal dependence? If Christ was personally self-sufficient, how could his human nature need any aid from another person? 
yet Christ did assert his personal dependence on the Father. He did not say, My human nature can do nothing of itself, yet I as God do the work. But speaking of himself as a distinct person, as the Messiah, the Son of God, he says, Of my own self I can do nothing. The words that I speak to you I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwells in me, he does the works. If you loved me, you would rejoice that I said, I go to my Father, for the Father is greater than I. I do nothing of myself, but as my Father has taught me, I speak these things. Could such declarations possibly be true had Christ been like the Father, self-sufficient and independent? Had it been a special object of Christ to put his disciples on their guard against deifying himself, I hardly know what language he could have used better adapted to such a purpose. Had he said, I am not God, but the dependent Son and ambassador of God, the Trinitarian might still have said, He spoke only of his human nature. And that, too, I believe with as much propriety as he gives this explanation to what we have on record. Another question occurs, if the Messiah was personally the living God, what occasion or motive could he have had to speak of the dependence of his human nature on a different person? Was not his own infinite wisdom and almighty power sufficient to supply all the defects and wants of his human nature? Besides, What motive could there have been for him to speak of the dependence of his human nature in a manner which he must have known implied the dependence of his whole person? The question whether he was a dependent or an independent being was one of great importance. It is so viewed at this day by his friends of all denominations. It could not be otherwise viewed by the Messiah himself and by his apostles. If, then, on a subject so serious and interesting to mankind, he could habitually speak in language so equivocal, so deceptive, so completely adapted to mislead both the learned and the ignorant, what confidence can be placed in what he said on other subjects? If he could repeatedly say, I can do nothing of myself, while in fact he could do everything of himself... What evidence can we have that he had not in all, he said, a concealed meaning directly opposite to what his words naturally conveyed? Something more serious, in my view, than the natural dignity of the Messiah is involved in the present inquiry. That is, his moral dignity, his uprightness, his benevolence, and his truthfulness as a teacher sent from God. Number five, two important texts considered. In the affectionate interview between Christ and his apostles, a little before the crucifixion, he said to them, The Father himself loves you because you have loved me and have believed that I came from God. In his prayer immediately following, while speaking of the apostles, Christ said to the Father, Now they have known that all things whatsoever you have given me are from you, for I have given them the words which you gave to me, and they have received them, and have known surely that I came from you, and have believed that you did send me. These passages deserve the serious attention of Christians. To have known surely that Christ came from God, and to believe that God sent him, must be very different from knowing that Christ was God equal with the Father and believing that he was an independent being. This must be admitted by Trinitarians, for they censure the faith of Unitarians as heretical or defective, although they truly believe that Christ came from God and was sent by God. Yet I think it must be admitted that Christ, in his prayer, approved the faith of his apostles in saying, They have believed that you sent me. And that, too, without the least intimation that they ever had believed or ever would believe that he was the living God. I may further remark that, in the passage first quoted, Christ gave them a solemn assurance of God's love to them and explicitly stated why they were so beloved of God. 
He, however, did not say, The Father loves you because you have believed that I am God and his equal. But these are his words. The Father himself loves you because you have loved me and have believed that I came from God. After having heard the numerous and dreadful condemnations which have been passed on all who believe that Christ was not God, but a beloved Son who came from God as commissioned and sent by the Father, who would have supposed that such a text as we have now before us could be found in the Bible? If Christ did not mistake as to the ground of God's approving love of the apostles, there certainly appears a great difference of opinion and feeling between God and too many Trinitarians. The very faith which was approved both by God and His Son has been condemned as blasphemous by many who would have it supposed that they are truly orthodox in their views of the Messiah. It's of no use here to say, it was only the human nature that the apostles believed came from God. For their love to Christ and their believing that He came from God are the only grounds on which it is said, the Father Himself loves you. Besides, Believing that Christ came from God is the only article of faith mentioned in the text. Whether the doctrine that Christ is the independent God be true or false, it certainly was not a belief in this doctrine which secured to the apostles the Father's love. Number 6. Dr. Campbell's Interrogations Applied Dodgewell wrote in favor of episcopy and asserted things which Dr. Campbell regarded as adding to the words of God. The doctor, in his lectures on ecclesiastical history, addressed two questions to Mr. Dodwell, which I think, with the omission of one word and the asperity of manner, might properly be addressed to a Trinitarian expositor. The questions are the following, quote, Shall I then believe that God, like deceitful man, speaketh equivocally and with mental reservations? Shall I take his declaration in the extent wherein he hath expressly given it? Or as you, for your own malignant purpose, have new vamped and corrected it? End quote. With all my heart, I would cancel the word malignant, though used by Dr. Campbell, for I have no disposition to impute a malignant purpose to my brothers in their strange interpretations of our Savior's words, nor in what they venture to add to them. But abating the asperity with which the doctor proposed the questions, I know not another case to which they may be more properly applied than to the explanations which have been given of our Lord's testimony relating to himself. For mental reservations are imputed to him, which, had he expressed them, would have rendered his testimony quite another thing from what it now is. Such mental reservations are imputed to him not merely once nor twice, but a great number of times, not in predictions which were to be explained by their fulfillment, nor in parables, nor on trivial subjects, but in solemn, private conversations with his apostles, respecting his own character and mission, and while preparing their minds for the trying scene of the crucifixion which was then at hand. Now what public teacher, nay, what good man, would be willing to have such a habit of equivocation and mental reservation imputed to himself as has been imputed to our constituted Lord and final judge? No sincere Christian can wish it to be believed that the Messiah deliberately used deceptive language to lead his followers into error respecting his character. If he did not, his language must be interpreted on the same principles which are applicable to the language of other ambassadors sent by God to men, unless he has given an explanation himself or by some inspired apostle. What then would be the meaning of his language of personal dependence on God had it been used by Moses? On the same principles, too, we may ask, what must be the meaning of Christ's words when he said, my God. His words, my Father and your Father, my God and your God, as clearly imply that he had a God as that his apostles had a God. But is there any sense in which the Supreme Being can say, my Father or my God? 
Yet it was not merely once that Christ personally acknowledged that he had a God. He did so in every prayer. He did so on the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Besides, I think few will deny that when Christ used the words, My Father, he spoke of the very same being as when he said, My God, and that by his Father, he meant his God and our God. Every time, therefore, that Christ said, My Father, or My God, his words implied that he himself was not the supreme being. How numerous, then, are the passages in which the Messiah clearly disclaimed all pretensions to be regarded as the Most High, the Jehovah of heaven and earth. When the Trinity's podcast returns, Worcester wraps up his case and ends with a devastating thought experiment. Number 7. Conclusion It will doubtless be remembered how freely Unitarians have been accused of irreverence for the Scriptures in accommodating them to their opinions by rejecting some passages in the common version and altering others. I do not deny that individuals may have given occasion for such a charge against themselves. But I would ask seriously whether there has been anything in the conduct of Unitarians in relation to the scriptures, which ought to excite more astonishment and regret than the conduct of the whole body of Trinitarians in their manner of explaining or interpreting the whole of Christ's testimony concerning himself. More is believed than a hundred distinct declarations or observations which implied his personal dependence, or that he was not God, must have something of the following import attached to neutralize them or to render them consistent with the Trinitarian hypothesis. Here Christ spoke only of his human nature, though he was God as well as man. Not only is the testimony of Christ thus interpolated and changed, but the testimonies of the evangelists and apostles respecting him have shared a similar fate that they may not contradict the Trinitarian doctrine. I have not computed the number of texts in the Apostles' testimony which clearly imply that Christ was not God, but I think they are more than 200. Now, if such an addition or explanation is warrantable, is it not amazing that the necessity of it never occurred to the mind of Christ, nor any one of his apostles or evangelists? Paul, in describing the warfare between the flesh and the spirit, makes use of the following language. For I know that in me, that is, in my flesh, dwells no good thing. Had he omitted the explanatory or parenthetical clause, how different would have been the meaning? We would have, for I know that in me dwells no good thing. Why did not the Messiah say, of myself, that is, as a man, I can do nothing? Or, I can of myself, that is, of my human nature, do nothing? as no such saving clause is in any instance used by Christ or suggested by his apostles. It has at least the appearance of being wise above what is written for men at this day to affirm that such a clause is always to be interpreted or understood in all that Christ said implying his personal dependence. If by asserting that Christ is God were meant no more than that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, that the miracles of Christ were properly the works of God, and that the doctrines and precepts of Christ were properly the words of God, which he has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, I could most gladly agree, for all these ideas I firmly believe to be true. But more than this is intended by Trinitarians. They say that Christ himself was personally God, equal with the Father, that is, 
equal to his God and our God. If Paul had been of this opinion, instead of saying, God was in Christ, he might have said, God was in God. And instead of saying, I bow my knees to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, he might have said, I bow my knees to the God and Father of our God Jesus Christ. In like manner, by the application of the Trinitarian hypothesis, almost everything that is said of the character of the Messiah, by himself or his apostles, becomes unintelligible or a contradiction to what their own words express. There surely is reason to question the correctness of a theory which so palpably contradicts the testimony of Christ and his apostles. Nothing, however, to be found in this discussion has been intended to impute blame or to impeach the moral character of any of my brothers. But a hope is entertained that the subject is set in such a light as will tend to excite more candor and union among Christians. Appendix As I have said so much to prove that explanations were certainly necessary respecting the language of dependence used by our Lord, If he was indeed the independent Jehovah, some may deem it incumbent on me to assign a reason why no explanations were given of the passages which have been supposed to imply his self-existence and independence. Should this be demanded of me, I may frankly say that I do not think it ever occurred to John that such ideas would ever be inferred from anything which he recorded as the words of Christ. The two following texts are, I believe, more relied on to prove that Christ was God than any others which were uttered by our Savior. John 8.58 Before Abraham was, I am. John 10.30 I and my Father are one. In the first of these texts, I cannot perceive that anything more was affirmed by Christ than that he was before Abraham. I am, however, aware that the self-existence of Christ has been inferred from the words I am with which the text closes. But Dr. Campbell, though a Trinitarian, freely admits that the words might be translated I was. Then the text would read, Before Abraham was, I was. If it occurred to John as possible that some might infer the self-existence of Christ from the words, I am, on account of God's assuming the name I am in a conversation with Moses, the apostle might well suppose that such a suspicion would be laid aside on comparing this text with what Christ said to the Jews in the 40th verse of the same chapter. If God were your father, you would love me, for I proceeded forth and came from God. Neither did I come of myself, rather, he sent me. What sense could be made of such declarations as the following? God proceeded forth and came from God. Neither did God come of himself, but God sent him. Yet such must be the import of Christ's words if he was God. In 1 Corinthians 15.10, Paul, speaking of himself, says, I am what I am. How similar is this to the language of Jehovah? I am that I am. If anyone wished to prove Paul a fourth person in the Godhead, with what force he might urge his assuming the divine name, I am what I am. It might indeed be replied that Paul said, By the grace of God I am what I am, which plainly implied his dependence on God, and that of course he was not God. This is acknowledged to be fair reasoning. Why then is it not admitted that the positive declarations of Christ respecting his dependence are proof that he did not mean to assert his self-existence by saying, Before Abraham was, I am. I and my Father are one. All who are acquainted with the Greek know that the word here translated one does not mean one person or one being, but rather one thing, as one in affection, one as to interest, or having one or the same object of pursuit. So, Paul says, he that plants and he that waters are one. And Christ, in prayer for his followers, says, Holy Father, keep through your own name 
those whom you have given me, that they may be one as we are one. Again, he says, The glory which you gave me I have given them, that they may be one even as we are one. If the Father and Son are but one being, then Christ prayed that the innumerable multitude of his followers might become one being. I may further observe that the language of Scripture must be understood according to some analogy known to men or not be understood at all. But what analogy does the universe afford to justify us in supposing that the Son meant to say that he and his Father were one or the same being? If a king's son should use precisely the same language in regard to himself and his father, who would even suspect that such was his meaning? As such a meaning is foreign to all analogy, we have great reason to believe that it is equally foreign to the truth. An Afterthought Hypothetical contrasts are sometimes useful. I shall therefore exhibit one. The recorded language of Christ we have seen to be as follows. I came not of myself. I have not spoken of myself, but the Father who sent me, he gave me a commandment, what I should say. Of my own self I can do nothing. The Father who dwells in me, he does the work. Accordant with these declarations was the whole testimony of Christ concerning himself. Let it now be supposed that, instead of the foregoing declarations, Christ had said, I came of myself, I have spoken of myself, without receiving any commandment, authority, knowledge, or power from any superior. Of mine own self I can do everything. No one in me does the work. Suppose, too, that the whole tenor of his testimony had implied his personal independence, self-sufficiency, and all-sufficiency. Suppose also that the Unitarians had attempted to neutralize all this testimony or to reconcile it to their hypothesis of the Son's dependence on God by saying, When Christ used language which seems to imply personal independence, he is to be understood as speaking not of himself as a person, but of the divine spirit or miraculous wisdom and power with which he was endued by God, Though he as a person was dependent, yet the Spirit of God which was given to him not by measure was independent and could do everything. Now what would Trinitarians say to such a project for evading the force of our Lord's testimony? Would they not pronounce it impious? Might they not very justly affirm that when Christ used the pronouns I, myself, me, he spoke of himself as a person, and that his declarations unequivocally affirmed his independence and self-sufficiency. The case is so clear that I do not see any reply that a Unitarian could make to such a statement. But if the supposed declarations of Christ respecting his personal independence would have been equivalent to saying, I am God and there is none beside me, why should not his real and positive declarations respecting his entire dependence be regarded as equivalent to saying, I am not the independent God? Let prejudice keep silence while conscience answers the question as in the presence of the Lord. What do you think? Did Worcester make his case? Have a lot of readers of the fourth gospel, in truth, underestimated the force of these apparently subordinationist passages? Let us know what you think in the comments on the blog post for this episode or in the Facebook group. Today's thinking music has been the track Space Full 
by Andy G. Cohen. As always, there's a link on the blog post for this episode where you can download or listen to that entire track. For listening, we'll see you online at trinities.org. Till next time, don't forget to love God with all your mind. <laughs>